Last Saturday, August 27th, people were enjoying a lovely afternoon here at Tanasi. While dining in the restaurant or on the patio, going out for a cruise on their boats, or making their way around this beautiful golf course, this idyllic setting was suddenly disrupted by billowing smoke, fire, and the command to evacuate immediately. While this devastating fire is certainly one of destruction, it soon became one of determination. We met up with Teleco Village Volunteer Fire Department Chief Jerry Dockerty at the station a few days after the fire. Chief Dockerty, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. And our viewers may be surprised to see that I'm almost as tall as the chief, but yes, I am standing on a stool to make that happen. So tell us, tell us about uh, where you were when you got the uh, alarm about the Tenassi fire and what happened next. Uh, I was at St. Thomas Church. Uh, we just had choir rehearsal and uh, waiting for mass to start and the alarm came off for a structure fire at Tenassi Clubhouse. One of my firefighters was at the restaurant at the time, and uh, he was the one that called it in. He was the third call to the 911 center. And how long did it take you to get there? Uh, I was 12 minutes out, but he was on the scene. The firefighter was on the scene and advising everyone that everyone was out of the building, and the kitchen area was the location of the fire. We don't know what the source of it was, but uh, it was engulfed. Is it unusual for a building of that size to be completely consumed so quickly? Uh, our theory is at this time was that the fire was burning before the alarm came, sounded and got called in. And it was involved in the attic area. We're not 100% we're not sure. Investigators are looking for that right now. Okay, and obviously we can't speculate on the cause because no. that will all come out during the investigation. That is correct. Location was the kitchen, cause unknown. I know there are other fire departments who responded to this fire, and can you tell me who they were and what role they played? Yeah, we had uh, a total of 49 firefighters on the scene, Philadelphia Fire Department, Greenback Fire Department, Loudoun County Fire and Rescue, and Lenore City Departments were on scene helping us. And tell us a little bit about how the Greenback uh, ladder helped you guys out. Uh, that is part of an automatic mutual aid in the county we entered into in 2018, so any structure fire that is confirmed off four uh, volunteer fire departments are dispatched to that call. So Greenback was responding immediately to that call and uh, we needed it. Tell me about the effort to get the golf cars out of the building and why that was so important. What we did is after we made the decision to go defensive and no one was in down below, we were prepared in case the golf carts caught on fire uh, to put the fires out because they're lithium ion batteries and they're fearful for, you cannot put a fire out with lithium ion batteries. They burn, burn, burn. So as soon as we were, the situation was safe, we uh, made the decision, okay, let's see if we can get the carts out. We got the carts out and then somebody says they need the chargers. So we were able to get the chargers out. That's amazing because that effort alone, while it kept um, the firefighters safe as for the lithium right. batteries not burning, but it also allowed us to um, resume golf operations very quickly. So we appreciate that effort. Yeah, it was, it was fun. I wish I had a body cam on to see the firefighters driving out of the building with the driving the carts. And it looks like it really was fun. So what would you say about the overall effort by the firefighters that day? Uh, it worked out well. We, the, our pre-plan worked. Uh, the hydrant out in the front of the building we supplied enough water. We ended up bringing our boat for additional 250 gallons of Minota water. And uh, we estimated about 80,000 gallons of water. Did you have any hope of saving the building after you arrived, or did you realize it was going to be a total loss right away? Upon my arrival, the whole A-B side of the building, that is the, to the left of the front entrance, uh, were flames coming through the roof. And we said, defensive mode right now. And we are thankful that there were no deaths or injuries. No, in inju no injuries to any firefighters. Uh, we sent 28 of them over to our local rehab for blood pressure, oxygen checks, and all that stuff. So people may have saw uh, we're old fire department. No, it was, we were, that's our protocols. Uh, what's the fire department focusing on right now in regard to this fire and recovery? Uh, working with the insurance companies, uh, they will be back most likely next week to start uh, digging through the rubble to see if they can come to the cause and origin of the fire. And we'll be just there to assist them in the future. Okay, and I'm sure there'll be updates as the story develops. And so, uh, we, like I said, we appreciate your time today, and we'll be in touch to get more information as the story develops. Okay, we thank you for the interview. 
Believe it or not, the golf course was closed for only one day, resuming operations about 40 hours after the fire at 8.30 on Monday morning. Our crew and I stopped by the course, and employee Chris Henderson shared some of the determination and teamwork that made it possible. So Saturday, the day of the fire, can't commend the uh, firefighters enough. They did an awesome job. They were here putting out the fire, and they were able to get into the cart barn and save all of our carts so that lithium batteries didn't catch on fire. It was awesome to watch. There was 10, 12, 15 firefighters shooting carts out. Uh, we were able to save the whole fleet, which in turn allows us to be up and operational within 24 hours of the fire. As we were shuttling them over to maintenance, 10 at a time, there was villagers and maintenance staff, red shirt staff taking them over, and then there were wives and, and people to help us shuttling us back over in their own personal vehicles. So there was probably 20 people assisting after the fire was put out to make sure the operations were still up and running and can't say how awesome it is to live here in Teleco Village. You guys did an awesome job. We're here now with Chief Development Officer Beth Kaburka and Director of Golf Chris Sykes. Chris, tell me, how in the world did you get golf operations up and running so quickly after the clubhouse was completely destroyed by fire? Well, it was a Herculean effort, really. Uh, the, the team rallied. You know, I always tell the guys we're in the solutions business, and we started working the problem literally before the flames were put out. So there were twofold. The check-in process, which we knew we could accommodate pretty quickly with the starter shack, uh, you know, the turn shack, and I knew Cal Kevin Alphon, our IT director, is phenomenal. Those guys are tremendous to work with. He started working on that immediately. So we were ready to rock and roll first thing come Monday. Uh, and thankfully, with the first responders and some good decision-making, uh, the golf cart fleet was spared. Uh, so remarkably, uh, all 60 car 62 cars are operational. Unbelievably, some have some cosmetic damage, some have some issues that we're still identifying. We found a screen, a Vista screen yesterday that wasn't working. So we swapped out the screen. We took the screen that was on there off. It out came, it poured, it poured out water. <laughs> so, you know, obviously we know where that came from. We had a lot of quick reactions some good decision making, incredible support uh, from within, from outside, uh, whether it's the villagers. And, and obviously this morning was incredible. Uh, the, the out, outflow of support there, uh, our vendor partners, our, our, our partners in, in the local golf community, the state golf community, everybody's been reaching out, rallying for our support. Uh, it's been really overwhelming uh, and necessary, and we're going to continue to need it. Now that we're operating out of the uh, starter turn shock, yep. um, tell us the process for checking in for golf and how golf uh, play is different. Sure. As you approach the Tenassi turn shack, uh, looking from right to left, the first bay is the snack shack, the second bay is golfer check-in, and the third bay is our starter ranger cart operations hub. So they'll go to that second window, check in, yep. and then what's different about play? Well, uh, the golf experience is really unaffected. That's unbelievable. On a regular play day, single tee day, you know, just come park your car in the Tenassi parking lot, walk up, be greeted by somebody lovely like uh, Carla here to get you checked in for golf, and then You'll be on your way, go to your car with your golf cart, get your equipment, and then go warm up. And then now we flip the operation. So hole 10 is now one. Hole 10 used to be one. So see if you can follow me. Keep up. <laughs> so 10 is now one. One was 10. So anyway, you're starting on the hole with the lake. You'll start on 10, and you'll finish on 9. And when you finish on 9, you simply exit to the right into the parking lot, drop off your equipment, and then return your cart to where the Tenassi pump house is. So that's where our new cart return and we'll rinse them off and then we'll work through that whole cart operations process. What can we as villagers do to keep this process running smoothly? Well, temporarily, and I tell you what, it was incredible, the support this morning. So the biggest current challenge is our cart operation. So we can only charge half the fleet at a time and where we're having to park and, and charge them is half a mile from where we need them. So getting the carts to and from that area to where we need them uh, to support play is quite the challenge. We'll turn to Beth now and talk to her about food services. So equally as fast, we had food services up and running so the golfers don't have to be famished or thirsty out there while they're playing. So tell us about that process. Well, immediately, just like with the golf side, Andy with AW Hospitality and his team were on the phone Saturday night. What do we need to do? And working with Chris, you know, they mobilized that the starter shack would be the best place, that there was space for food service. Um, Diana, who is the manager at Tenassi on the food service side, come in on Sunday, helped clean the starter shack, um, went and borrowed um, items from other clubhouses that weren't 
in dire need there um, and was able to get two col uh, coolers stacked with soft drinks, beer. She brought chips and candy bars, uh, brats, hot dogs, and chicken salad sandwiches brought over on a daily basis that they can then sell to golfers. Is there any seating over there? Um, yes, they actually brought over a couple tables and some chairs and they're in the few shade trees that are over there. So there is a place for people to sit down and eat their hot dog. So it's great that there's food services available. Our golfers won't be famished or thirsty on the course. Um, but there are a lot of villagers who are concerned about the AWE employees from the Tenassi restaurant. Can you tell me some of the options that are being considered for them? Absolutely. So one of the, the initial very, I mean, Saturday night when this is all happening, you know, me and Skylar and Edgar were all together at the Yacht Club celebrating on the 35th anniversary. And Skylar said, well, I guess we're opening the Yacht Club because we have to have a place for our staff to work. And I said, oh yeah, absolutely. So the plan currently is to add nine shifts to the Yacht Club. So it'll be lunch and dinner seven days a week. And as you know, that is not the normal schedule. And all of our Tenassi food service family will be coming to the Yacht Club to provide lunch and then the extra dinner services um, so the best way for villagers to support them in this effort is to show up and eat lunch at the Yacht Club all of our family will be there so you can come and see all of our long-term employees and wish them well they're gonna be there for a while do people have access to the boat docks so they can uh, go out and enjoy the lake Yes, people are welcome to come to their boats. Um, we just ask that they park to the left of the clubhouse, um, closer to the number nine green. Walk around the pine trees, down the sidewalk, into the boat docks that way. Um, in the near future, they'll have a fence up and it'll be a little easier for them to know exactly where to go. All right, Beth, so now I'll ask you the question that's on everybody's mind. What's next? What's next for the Tenassi Clubhouse? We have ordered uh, fencing to go around the clubhouse so it'll be a little tighter than what the rope has been and it will for sure keep people out because the Tenassi Clubhouse is no longer a safe place for people to be. It really could fall at any time and so safety is our number one concern. Um, the next phase would be once insurance gives us the all go, um, we'll have it dim mode. It'll go back down to just dirt. That way it's safe as we work on planning, strategizing, planning, <laughs> strategizing about what the new Tenassi Clubhouse is going to look like, exactly where it's going to sit. And that is not going to be a fast process. There's a lot to consider. And I'm sure that's part of the overall plan for not only the clubhouse, but for golf at Teleco Village and I mean at Tenassi and where everything's going to be, right? Absolutely. This is going to be a blank slate again. So what a new clubhouse is going to look like, where it's going to be positioned, how big it needs to be, are all things that need to be considered. In the long range plan already, we had a kitchen expansion for Tenassi planned. Um, so we know it needs to be bigger. So now we just have to get all those details. I mean, it's going to be a process. And of course, we will bring villagers along the way. And that's why it is so important for villagers to be signed up for the telegram, because that is the POA's number one source of news. So if people really want to know what's going on from the POA perspective, they really need to be um, registered for that. It's not something we can automatically sign villagers up for. You can do that at the Welcome Center. You can do it online. There is a link. Um, you can call. You can come in. There's so many ways to do it. So we just encourage everyone to subscribe and to read it. Thanks again, Beth. I'm assuming we don't have a timeline for how how long any of that's going to take. Unfortunately, no. Sorry. I, I had a feeling. All right. Thanks again. This story will continue to develop and Teleco Village Network will bring you updates as we know more. In the meantime, stay informed by visiting the website at telecovillagepoa.org. And while you're there, sign up for the Telegram, the weekly e-newsletter that is the number one official source for news in the village. As always, thank you for watching Teleco Village Network.